with um, request uh, and a few other things. Um, biggest uh, difference uh, for me is that they are uh, fully open source. So the community edition you can install by yourself and you have a fully open source uh, um, uh, uh, version control uh, uh, software. Um, it's very nice for uh, on-premise uh, uh, environments uh, where uh, uh, companies are not necessarily uh, very happy about uh, pushing their code to uh, various cloud environments or SaaS uh, products. Uh, GitLab makes a very nice uh, uh, on-prem uh, alternative. Um, there's a uh, um, community edition and a enterprise edition. If you uh, are at a company that has the financial means, I would recommend you to go with the enterprise edition simply because in order for the community edition to exist, people need to pay for the enterprise edition. Um, so we all benefit from that. Uh, we are an enterprise user as well, uh, but we also use open source for the uh, uh, clients where that is uh, um, the better option. Uh, GitLab CI uh, is a, a, a continuous integration service. Um, the nice thing is that it's fully integrated with, uh, with GitLab itself. So um, because of the fact that most of the time when you're doing some kind of CI, it's uh, very tightly coupled to your to the source code that you want to do CI on, uh, it's quite nice that uh, GitLab CI is um, uh, so closely closely coupled. Um, it's fully open source, as I already said. Um, if you are already using GitLab CI, uh, GitLab Community Edition, uh, all you need to do is check in a git GitLab CI.yaml file and presto, you're uh, getting started. Um, it's not actually true. You'll also need a runner, uh, but we'll get to that uh, in a minute. Um, this minute. Uh, <laughs> In GitLab CI, uh, runners uh, are what is referred to as machines or environments that run your. Is a, are you guys okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, green shirts is uh, <laughs> they fix trouble. Um, so the, the runners they uh, they run your uh, your builds. Um, there are many different uh, different types of runners, but uh, basically a runner is uh, some kind of environment that uh, that picks up builds uh, from uh, GitLab CI uh, through the, uh, the internal APIs. Um, it can be specific to a to a to a project or uh, serve any project. So uh, specific to a project is, for instance, if you have a certain code that has that can that only works for Windows, then you will have a runner that runs Windows, and you won't uh, want to run your other uh, projects on them. So see later on how we can uh, uh, determine which uh, uh, projects get uh, run on which runners. Um, but in general, runners are the isolated environments where you run your code. There are a ton of different uh, runners. You can look them up, uh, but uh, most useful uh, at the moment, depending on your project, of course, is uh, the, the Docker runner. Um, it, ju it just runs one or more Docker containers that pick up builds, execute a bunch of stuff, and then throw it all away uh, after it's done. Um, it's very uh, easy to get started. Um, the uh, uh, the way the, 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 the standard runner is set up uh, with GitLab is uh, uh, very easy to run. However, if you're going to run this in production for a longer period of time, look into the actual Docker uh, uh, installations underneath. Um, we had one problem where, by default, it was using one of those storage drivers where it can only eat space and it can never release space. Uh, won't get into that here, um, but uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's useful to, to look into that. Um, I would recommend running your runners on a separate VM, so you have a uh, one VM that runs uh, the GitLab C uh, GitLab installation, in, including the GitLab CI, and then one VM that runs runners. That's the easiest. Um, so the Docker runner basically uh, uh, goes against what the real idea of Docker was uh, and abuses all your uh, uh, your Docker runners as uh, uh, throwaway VMs, um, which feels a bit awkward at first, but it's actually quite nice after you get used to it because it just simply works. Um, I currently do a lot of uh, operations uh, stuff, so a lot of Puppet uh, uh, code, and uh, we use a lot of uh, uh, GitLab CI for testing Puppet code, and it's actually really nice because 
the thing with Puppet Code is that uh, it actually makes changes to a system if you're going to run anything. So uh, you want these kind of throwaway environments because you don't want to use it twice. You want to start with the same baseline every time. For I guess for web applications, that's a little bit different because they usually don't make that many changes to uh, the actual system underneath. Um, but um, yeah, in our case, it's quite important. Um, so. As I said, the only thing you need to do is in your GitLab project, uh, uh, which is the same as a uh, as a uh, how to say that a GitHub project or a Bitbucket project, whatever. Um, so in your project, in the root of your project, you check in a file called .gitlab-ci.yaml, and uh, here on the right we see the simplest one of the simplest versions of what you could be doing. Um, so we're, uh, we're choosing a Docker image here. This specifies which image we're, uh, we're running. Just comes from uh, uh, the Docker Hub. Uh, and then uh, we have one job called test here. This label can be anything you want. So if you wanted to be your mother's name, that's totally fine. Um, it's probably more convenient to use something that actually means anything, but hey. <laughs> Um, and then uh, in its simplest form, it has a script uh, uh, parameter, and that just has a number of statements that you want it to execute. In this case, we'll do a bundle install, uh, and then a bundle, uh, and then we'll uh, uh, do a rake lint and a rake syntax task. This was taken from one of our Puppet projects, but you get the point. Uh, so once you've checked this into your repository, uh, uh, from that moment on, uh, for every push to the branch that has this uh, uh, file in it, it'll run uh, your build. Uh, for every merge request, it will also run. Um, but you have to be uh, uh, understanding that uh, your uh, GitLab CI can be different between branches. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that, um, but you'll notice it when you make changes to a GitLab CI file. Then you'll probably have it sitting in a, in a topic branch first, uh, which gets a, gets a merge request. And until that is merged, you have two different uh, uh, GitLab CI uh, uh, files. Um, so you have to be a bit aware of what it's actually running. It's not a big deal, but you could intentionally abuse that if you wanted to, if you have some kind of a specific situation, um, but I haven't really uh, run into that. Um, so jobs, this uh, little test here is, a, is a, basically a job name. Um, so the jobs can be run in all of these different uh, ways. Uh, as I said, these are, these are basically the runners. Uh, you could run it locally, but then you're screwing with your uh, uh, GitLab, uh, uh, the VM that GitLab runs on, so I wouldn't recommend that. Um, and then varying degrees of uh, complexity that also provide uh, uh, flexibility. You can even connect to a remote SSH server if you really need to run it on that specific machine because, I don't know, it has an IP address or it has something else that it has to be uh, running on that machine. And that's also totally possible. Um, as you see here, uh, though, we have now split up our, uh, our GitLab CI uh, file into multiple jobs. Um, so it's doing exactly the same as what it was doing here, a bundle install, a rake lint, and a rake syntax. There are two good reasons why you want to uh, keep your jobs as small as possible. Um, the first one is because you uh, uh, can then, uh, um, how to say that? Uh, parallel, these jobs can now run in parallel. So if you have multiple runners available, these jobs can run in parallel, cutting your build time in theoretically half. It won't be exactly half, but cutting your build time. And if you multiply this by a lot, uh, that will save you a bunch of time. Um, so the first reason is to, to, to enable parallel parallelization. Um, and uh, the second uh, reason is that uh, um, if something goes wrong with a, with a job, it's much nicer to have a very specific uh, place to go and search. You'll have to dive into the, uh, the, the, uh, the build log anyway, um, but if you already know that you failed against rake syntax, then you know exactly like this is where the, the, the problem is going to be. Um, one more thing that we see here is the before script uh, uh, section, where um, before script is a special, it's not a job, this is a special uh, uh, configuration uh, uh, parameter um, which runs a bundle install or actually whatever is in the before script is run before the script of every job. It's unimaginable how uh, <laughs> uh, 
how difficult this is, but uh, yeah, it, it's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, the before script runs before every job. Um, you see that I created the names of the jobs here using job colon test colon syntax. It's not actually necessary. You could just call this job syntax, um, but because we have things that are jobs and things that are not jobs in the GitLab CI uh, file, I find it very convenient to uh, prefix all the jobs with job. And later on, we'll see that this syntax job runs in the test uh, environment. So I like to call my jobs job, like literally the word job, then the name of the environment, and then the name of the job so that it becomes more easy to, for you to grasp what runs where and, the, uh, um, and when. So if you do that, uh, you can create a nice little pipeline. So you have multiple jobs, and you can create a nice little pipeline. So these are all individual jobs. And GitLab creates this overview for you automatically. Um, we'll see in a minute how these are different uh, stages and how to, to uh, mash all of these together. But after a build has passed, uh, you, uh, you get your pipeline. Actually, while it's running, you can see this pipeline as well. You can see the progress and you can see the, the jobs completing or not completing. Um, and you'll see little green check marks. Once a build has been completed, you can see that it's in progress. You can click on it and see the, the build log uh, uh, um, uh, getting created, uh, all of that. Um, the, uh, this is a link to the commit that uh, created the, uh, uh, the uh, um, that's being tested. Um, here you see one special thing that you probably noticed, uh, a red cross, but it's continuing anyway. Um, it's a special feature, I won't dive into it too much, but you can set uh, certain jobs to allow them to fail. So it's okay that it doesn't build on Windows because who wants, oh no wait. Um, it's okay that it uh, fails on Windows for whatever the specific reason is. This is actually the pipeline of uh, the GitLab CI multi-runner, I think, the Docker runner for uh, GitLab CI. Uh, just made a screenshot of that to show you how a pipeline uh, looks. Um, so this was really nice, this bundle install thing, but it has a problem. Does anybody know what the problem is? Imagine we're running this a thousand times a day. Sorry? Exactly. So we're doing this bundle install before this job, before this job, times a thousand. That just adds up. We could easily uh, reduce that amount of time uh, spent on that by using what is called artifacts and dependencies. Um, so an artifact, uh, a job can export an artifact, which is just a bunch of files that are created by that job, or maybe not created by that job, but usually created by that job. Um, that can then be used in subsequent uh, jobs uh, throughout the pipeline. So exactly, why would we run bundle install every time? It doesn't really make any sense. If you run bundle install with a dash dash deployment, uh, it'll um, install all the gems in the directory where your, uh, uh, your gem file is uh, in a subdirectory called vendor. Um, so we've changed the, the script a little bit. We make it bundle install dash dash deployment and then uh, we create artifacts uh, from the vendor path. So everything that's in the vendor path will, after this job is done, be zipped up and uh, sent to, the, uh, to GitLab, where uh, uh, this job then downloads it, because these jobs can actually be running on different runners, on different physical machines, on different, different virtual machines, on different Docker, ho uh, uh, Docker instances. Um, so they're communicated back and forth. Um, you want to make sure that you set this uh, expire in uh, flag uh, because uh, by default expiry is never. Uh, and that means that all your artifacts are going to be on your GitLab server forever and ever eternally. And that just uses a bunch of space. So uh, expire them in whatever is convenient. Uh, after this time, it would be deleted, but this is a vendor, it's a bunch of downloaded gems. so. Nobody really cares about them after the pipeline has been completed. Um, it does mean that the pipeline has to complete within a day, but I'm willing to gamble that that is actually happening. <laughs> um, 
So this job uh, exports the artifacts. Uh, but then, obviously, we need to say in these jobs that they are actually depending on uh, the original, on the artifacts job. So we see that now I've created a job in the uh, called job build artifacts. And now here, the other two jobs have a dependency on job build artifacts. And because of the dependency, they automatically download the artifacts from the job that they are depending on. Um, and uh, the first uh, line is bundle install dash dash deployment, which uh, wants to go through my gem file and download all the gems that are in there, except that it sees it, it's getting this vendor directory uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the artifacts job. So uh, it automatically uh, sees that all of the gems are already there, and it doesn't need to do anything. And then we can continue as normal with the, with the other jobs. This example is obviously uh, specific to Ruby, but you can hopefully imagine how this works for whatever language you're uh, uh, in and whatever situation you're in. It's a very, very flexible uh, system. Um, so stages uh, uh, allow you to uh, create different uh, uh, you know, stages of a, uh, of a pipeline. Uh, it's what you saw here. These are stages, pre-build, test, build, package, release. Uh, and we define them like this. These are actually the default stages, but we've mentioned them here for clarity, and you can add as many stages as you want. Um, the stages will be run through in the order that you define them here. So if you put test before build, then that's the then first all the jobs in the test uh, stage will be done, and then all the ones in the uh, build stage. Um, jobs of the same stage that don't have dependencies can run in parallel. So um, Again, referring back to this, these four jobs will all run in parallel, if they can, which reduces our, t uh, our time significantly from running them all in sequence. Uh, so it's very simple. Uh, all we need to do is, in, in each job, determine the stage that it's in, build, test, test. Um, the deploy stage, I left it out because it's short enough already. Um, is it readable for the guys in the back? Mm, yeah, I was wondering while I was making the slides, I was like, yeah, that's going to depend on the size of the screen. Um, I'll uh, put up the slides in the, in the uh, FOSDEM uh, uh, website as well after this, so you can uh, take a look there. Um, so that's stages, uh, fairly uh, uh, straightforward also. Uh, limiting builds. I don't know, how am I doing on time? What's uh 15. Oh, perfect. Uh, so sometimes you want certain builds to not run, uh, sorry, certain jobs to not always run. Um, you can think of uh, jobs that uh, take a lot of resources, either lots of time or lots of processing power. Uh, then you might want to think, hey, I only want to run these uh, uh, when I'm actually deploying to, uh, to an, uh, a staging or a production environment, or I want to only run these for the master uh, uh, branch. Uh, for that, we have two uh, options. We have only and we have accept. Uh, and as you might uh, expect, only defines a list of git refs for which the build is created, and accept uh, a list of uh, git refs for which it's not created. Uh, so, in this case, uh, we will uh, um, only run this for the uh, for the master uh, uh, branch. Uh, except, yeah, you wouldn't actually use this combination like this together. Um, but uh, uh, so you can actually so it, it works on Git ref, so it works on tags as well as on uh, branch names. So you could actually have. Uh, 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 branches, a branch name here, so you run it only for a master branch, except for uh, uh, builds that are tagged as develop. Um, there is also a, a special uh, uh, key that you can put here, and I forget what it's called. A special key which only a lot, uh, runs this job if it's specifically requested through the API. Um, Triggers, that's the one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so 
the use case for that, in, in my opinion, is uh, relatively limited, but I presume it's there because that's why it's built. Um, um, but yeah. Um, we also see here allow failure. This is that tag that I was mentioning that allows this uh, Windows build, uh, this Windows uh, job to finish, and uh, the rest of the pipeline can continue anyway. Um, selecting specific runners, so you can uh, um, use tags uh, in a job to make sure that a job only runs on a specific uh, runner. So as you're uh, registering a runner, uh, for instance, if you're registering a Windows machine, uh, or sorry, a Windows runner, uh, you can say, hey, you can tag it with Windows, and then uh, uh, in your jobs, you can tag your Windows jobs with Windows, and nothing else will run on those, mach on those runners except for uh, uh, jobs that have been tagged Windows. Um, yeah, you can have multiple tags, so uh, whatever you, uh, it's, it's fairly a uh, flexible uh, system. You see them here as well. Uh, Using this system, uh, you can uh, you can do things that uh, uh, not only for uh, uh, for Windows uh, and non-Windows, but also for um, if you have uh, 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 runners running in in different uh, cloud environments, for instance, they won't necessarily always be able to run the same kind of uh, uh, um, uh, jobs. So you can you can very fairly flexible um, uh, define here which jobs can run where. Uh, manual build, a small but very important uh, introduction uh, that makes uh, for a nice uh, finish. So manual builds are very simple, uh, um, but they will create this little play button here, and the only way to run this build, uh, this job, is by clicking that button. Um, this can be very useful for this kind of setup where you want to test and build and deploy to staging, you don't care. As, as long as the previous jobs all complete successfully, then let's go and uh, uh, deploy to staging. Um, but the actual deploy to production, you want a human being to actually press that button and say, hey, let's go and deploy this. Um, so you said manual to true. I didn't actually include the, uh, um, uh, how to say that? The the parameter, but it's literally called manual, and you set it to true. I think you can figure it out. Um, if you set that uh, up, then uh, um, your build will be manually deployed. Uh, only, uh, uh, sorry, your job will only be executed uh, when you manually press that uh, that button. Um, we use that for exactly this uh, this setup. Uh, so we have uh, uh, um, some uh, some Puppet repositories, and we don't care about Puppet code going to staging server. Uh, that's totally fine. Um, but for Puppet code to go to uh, production server requires all kinds of unfortunate uh, approvals from people. But uh, um, uh, once they are uh, there, then somebody can simply press this button so that nobody has to actually touch the production server. Uh, and it, it becomes really nice. Uh, if you couple this with, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, LDAP uh, authentication for GitLab, then you can really closely determine who can uh, uh, deploy to uh, your production environments. Uh, secret variables uh, needs a little bit of work, in my opinion, but it's already uh, 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 there. Um, so sometimes you have things that you want to uh, um, not show in your uh, uh, GitLab CI uh, YAML file. So for instance, uh, passwords to places or uh, API keys, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can have your whole project be open source, but it's really, it really would be convenient to not have your AWS uh, uh, access uh, secrets to, uh, checked into your GitLab CI uh, uh, file. For this, there are secret variables. Uh, they are on the on the GitLab project level. So in your project, you determine you define this variable has this uh, value, and then in your uh, GitLab CI, uh, the YAML, you can just use them as a variable uh, to uh, uh, that will automatically get the value from the uh, from the secret uh, variable from the project. Um, the downside is that currently they are not masked. 
and will just show up in the build log. So if you are using, I don't know, an, uh, AWS credentials in your, that are actually a secret variable in your project, uh, if something in your build prints the, uh, those variables to, uh, to the log, they will just show up. So it's kind of a dangerous uh, thing at the moment. You have to be really careful about this. Um, there is a, uh, an issue open for this, uh, which uh, uh, is developing uh, slowly but nicely. And I'm sure that uh, not too uh, uh, long in the future, we will have a solution for this where automatically uh, the build log will not contain uh, uh, these things. Um, to go a little bit more advanced, uh, you'll fairly quickly probably run into a place where you say, hey, but I want access to this uh, private repository. And the, um, the, Git, the, the Docker runner or the runner, the GitLab CI runner, does not have special privileges to access your GitLab uh, instance. It only has the specific uh, uh, commit uh, that you are testing at that moment. So if you want to do things with, in this case, SSH, uh, for instance, private repositories, then you'll have to get a bit creative um, to be able to, uh, to get that working. Uh, how does it work? Um, so first you create a new SSH uh, key pair uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, add the private key as a secret variable uh, inside the, the, the project. The, uh, the public key, uh, uh, you will, uh, uh, um, how to say that? Uh, put it here, where you, and then in a before script, before the job, uh, so we have a, a very simple test job here that this SSH is to get at gitlab.com and then does a git clone, uh, just simply to show how it works. Uh, it does a git clone of a private repository. Um, so the only thing you need to do in your before script is make sure that whatever environment you're running in actually has SSH agent installed and uh, has the private key, uh, uh, how to say that, uh, creates the private key on the, uh, on, the, on the build environment that you're running at that moment. Um, so we just, in this case, we do an apt get update and apt get install of open SSH client. Uh, we SSH add the private key. See, this is the dollar SSH private key. Uh, is the uh, reference to the secret variable that lives on the on the project level. We create a .ssh uh, directory. Um, we set ho uh, strict host key checking off uh, in the ssh config file. This is all mumbo jumbo that just boils down to get this environment ready to uh, to do a uh, a checkout of a private uh, repository. And then here uh, you can actually. Uh, do the git clone of the private repository. The nice thing is that this will be destroyed the moment uh, after the build is done. Um, however, um, you have to be careful to not somewhere accidentally print this private key to your build log because then your private key is there. Uh, especially if you're doing open source projects, uh, this becomes a bit more of a, uh, uh, of a challenge uh, because you want to make sure that nobody ever accidentally does something in your, in your uh, build log that uh, prints that key. Um, so as for the use case of this, so one is to, to, to uh, check out private repositories. The other one is uh, to, um, uh, to deploy to production servers or any kind of server that is not uh, in the same, uh, that's not uh, easily accessible. Um, so if you have a, a, a deploy job, uh, like here, for instance, in this deploy job, uh, you could have here some, uh, some uh, commands that actually uh, SSH into your production machine and run a command there uh, or um, uh, run a command over SSH on your production uh, uh, instance, whatever you, uh, you prefer. Um, either way, uh, this looks a bit complicated, but it's a really a one-time one thing, and it's, uh, it's fairly well documented what you need to have there. Uh, and once you do that, uh, it becomes very easy to, uh, to do secure uh, uh, communication with uh, uh, different places. Is that clear? Everybody awake? 
No. <laughs> um, one of the last things I want to show is the, the YAML anchors. This is not actually a GitLab CI feature. This is uh, some deep, dark corner of YAML that allows this stuff. Um, we don't actually use it because I find it to be a, um, a fairly, uh, um, how to say that, complicated way of uh, uh, accomplishing things. But depending on what you're doing and how much duplication of, uh, of stuff you have in your GitLab CI file, this might become useful. Um, so this stuff here on the left is equal to this stuff on the right. And this is purely on a YAML level. So GitLab CI doesn't really have anything to do with this. It's just a trick that you can use to have some deduplication in your, uh, uh, in your GitLab CI file. So to run through it real quickly, uh, so we, we, we define this, uh, uh, this hidden key uh, called job template, uh, and then we assign all of these things to it. And then everywhere where we use it, we, this, these uh, less than signs, they are actually merging. And this is the, uh, um, uh, the job definition that refers to this job definition. Uh, and it gets merged into this test, uh, uh, test one job. So what we see is that this stuff is equal for, t for job one and, and job two. Uh, so we might as well extract it here. So this actually expands on a YAML level to, uh, to this, where we have two jobs, one called test one, uh, um, which uses Ruby 2.1 and Postgres and Redis. And you see the, sa the exact same thing here. So you could just as well use this, or actually this. Um, but this has the deduplication, especially if this becomes, if n becomes larger than two, that becomes uh, more useful to have that uh, that kind of uh, uh, deduplication. Um, use it with care because it has a tendency to get really rough really quickly. Uh, we've played around with it and then decided not to uh, not to use it. That's uh, kind of it. I was going to do a demo, but uh, I was smart enough to buy a new MacBook Pro 2016 kind of thing, and it has USB-C only, so I thought, oh, okay, I'll uh, buy every connector under the sun, um, except for VGA, because that's kind of a 1996 thing. And of course, FOSDEM runs everything on VGA, so uh, I'm graciously borrowing uh, Tyler's uh, um, uh, laptop and therefore demoing is going to be a little bit tricky. Um, however, are there any questions? Whoa, bunch of questions. Sorry, come again? Ah, so the question is, uh, um, so that the, the, imagine that you have jobs that are not necessarily pass or fail, um, but do you have some kind of metric that you want to use? Um, not directly that I am aware of, but there is, uh, for instance, for uh, code coverage, which is one of the use cases I could imagine this, uh, you'd want this for. Um, there is a... Uh, I would almost call it the hack that uh, allows you to define a regular expression on the GitLab level uh, f that will be searched in the build log uh, for uh, the output of the code coverage percentage. Um, but other than that, uh, right now it's a binary thing. Um, I'm also looking at our GitLab friend over there, and so if I'm incorrect at something, you have to uh, uh, tell me that I'm incorrect, but I think that's the way it is, right? Uh, there are more questions, yeah. Um, so the question is, Log with a G or log lock with a CK? 
Um, so the question is, uh, can, can GitLab CI uh, lo lock uh, other resources than, uh, than the runner? Uh, I am not aware of it. So the, you can do this in the scripts if you can find a creative way to do that. Um, but I'm not aware of, uh, of it being able to, uh, uh, to do other uh, external things at the moment. So the, the artifacts, uh, 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 how are they kept? So you refer to them by, uh, um, so by default they are available within the same build uh, of the pipeline, um, but you can uh, make some changes to that uh, by having a, a, the key that with which they are stored. Uh, you can change that uh, so that you can use them across builds as well. I haven't personally played with that, so I cannot tell you the details, but I've seen that that is, uh, is indeed possible. Yeah, so you have to, the question is, do you, do you need to update them? So what we do, because uh, uh, this comes actually straight from an actual CI that we're using. Uh, so what we're doing is here we do a bundle install dash dash deployment, uh, which stores everything in the vendor subdirectory. And then here we do a bundle install dash dash deployment again. It might have changed. It's Super unlikely for our use case at the moment, but this is how you would do it if you have a longer cache time or you want to use them across builds, uh, and then you, you, you can do a construction like this to make sure that, hey, nothing should have changed, but please go and check that that is actually the case. Can you use Docker's layered file system for artifacts? Uh, to be honest, I have no answer to that question. <laughs> You'd have to look it up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't get your second question. Let me ask. The, let me answer the first question first. And then, the, so the first question was, uh, uh, where do the logs go? The logs go back to GitLab CI itself. So they're not stored on the runner. So you you can access your logs as far back as your uh, uh, as your history of pipeline uh, goes. So you can always uh, look back at your uh, logs. And your second question? Code review. Yeah, so, so the, the question is, can you integrate code review? Um, theoretically, you would solve that problem on the GitLab side and not necessarily on the GitLab CI side. So uh, what we do, for instance, is that uh, um, uh, somebody creates code, does a merge request with the, uh, with the uh, upstream, and then uh, um, uh, that needs to be reviewed before the merge request gets merged. And then, because then you also have the ability in GitLab to do to use commenting and uh, push further commits to the to the build. So the the um, uh, the testing is what is done on the on the GitLab CI side, and the the human aspect of the code review that happens on the on the GitLab side. Can you pass Docker file instead of the image? So uh, the question is, can you pass a Docker file instead of an image? You cannot uh, theoretically uh, directly pass a Docker file, but since one of the last couple of versions, uh, there's an internal Docker registry built into GitLab C uh, CI itself. So you can actually build your own Docker instances and push them to, uh, uh, to GitLab CI and then refer to them here. So they don't ever need to see the outside world. They just all, everything lives in, in GitLab. Yeah, that's. Come and talk to me after the, the session because that's exactly one of the things that I wanted to look into uh, 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 sometime soon. So you can actually build a, a Docker image from a Docker image and then uh, use that in the rest of your uh, uh, pipeline, uh, which is quite a nice uh, uh, solution. Uh, 
So the question is, what if you have multiple source repositories that depend on each other and you want to uh, do CI uh, on uh, a combination of these deployments? So um, this has been a problem for us as well. Uh, specifically, um, we had two repositories. One is a uh, Puppet control repository and the other one is a Puppet module. Um, the GitLab CI, whenever you push to the Puppet module, uh, so the, the control repository is kind of what sits at the top and it checks out a bunch of modules including this one that we were making changes to. The module had its own uh, CI process and the control repository had its own CI process. What happened is that uh, if you push nearly simultaneously, because sometimes it happens, you made a bunch of changes and it, it, it touches both of those uh, repositories. So. Um, uh, we would push to one repository, which has an automatic deploy to staging environment, or both of them have an automatic deploy to staging environment if everything is green. You push to them simultaneously. This pipeline completes fine and pushes to, uh, uh, to your staging environment. This pipeline does not com uh, complete fine and actually breaks the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the code base. So as this one is deploying to your staging environment, you are now deploying broken code because it actually checks out the, uh, the other job as well. Uh, and we've had some, um, let's say, unfortunate side effects. <laughs> I mean, we didn't just, we didn't actually drop any production databases, so we're <laughs> still. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist making a joke at least once. I do commend you if you haven't looked into it. So GitLab uh, uh, um, uh, accidentally uh, uh, dropped a uh, or destroyed a production database this week and had a massive uh, uh, outage from this. But if you want to see how you want to do operations, the, it is absolutely exemplary how they uh, were public about this. There was a Google Doc that you could openly access that has all the, uh, uh, the details in it, what happened, who fixed what, who went where, uh, what are the consequences, how are we learning from this. Uh, at some point, there was even a, a YouTube live uh, feed where you could just watch engineers uh, fix uh, uh, GitLab's production uh, uh, environment. Um, does, uh, I'm really impressed by that, and really, the, it's an unfortunate uh, um, turn of events where somebody made a mistake, and then it turned out that all the fail safes didn't really actually work. Um, I've been there, and it's not a great place. It doesn't make you a bad engineer. It just it's that one unfortunate. Um, one in a gazillion uh, cases that it happens to everyone at, at some point. Anyway, I digress. Any more questions? Do you have any notifications if a job succeeds or fails? Yes. So first of all, there's email. Uh, I think it's enabled by default. If you enable the, the email, so the SMTP settings in GitLab, then it uh, automatically starts emailing you when, uh, when, jobs, uh, when pipelines uh, fail or succeed. Um, uh, secondly, GitLab also comes uh, uh, packaged with uh, uh, a, an open source Slack alternative called Mattermost. If you haven't looked into it, do look into it because it's really, really a great uh, uh, communication platform. Um, fully open source. It is already deployed. If you have GitLab uh, CE uh, installed with the Omnibus installer, it's already there. Uh, literally one line and you can start using it uh, and uh, GitLab CI will post notifications to uh, Mattermost channels uh, if you wanted to. You can also do web, web hooks and a whole bunch of other uh, stuff. It's all GitLab level uh, stuff. In the back. Somebody in the back has a really urgent <laughs> question. So the, the plans, I don't know anything about it. I have no uh, official ties to uh, GitLab other than uh, we uh, buy some licenses from them. But uh, So the question is uh, a build matrix is where you say, hey, what, I want to run all versions of this against all versions of that. I can honestly say that I don't know if that currently exists. Yeah, so then you get into dirty, ugly YAML uh, for now. No, um, it doesn't exist yet. Uh, we are kind of evaluating possible options. There is a lot of 
actual problems with matrices and just including excluding some of the variants and it becomes sometimes also quite fuzzy. So uh, this is also the reason just to keep YAML simple. Maybe there is a little bit of sophistication in the YAML, but at least you uh, really know what is happening there. Mm, but there is a number of improvements for YAML.